sobering prophecy in the book of Amos about end time Israel. I'd like to start there today. If you'll turn to Amos chapter 4. Amos chapter 4. And breaking into the thought, he's talking about the things that will be happening to end time Israel. He talks about in verse 6, Also I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, lack of bread in all your places, yet you have not returned to me. Verse 7, I also withheld rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest. Made it rain on one city, withheld rain from another city. Verse 8, yet you have not returned to me. Verse 9 in Amos chapter 4, I blasted you with blight and mildew when your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, yet you have not returned to me. Verse 10, I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword, yet you have not returned to me. To me. Verse 11 I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning, yet you have not returned to me. Therefore, he says in verse 12, thus will I do to you, O Israel, and because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Prepare to meet your God. That's really one of the messages of this day, isn't it? We're talking about the Feast of Trumpets. We're observing the Feast of Trumpets. We're talking about end time events leading up to the return of Christ. We're talking about judgments on Israel and ultimately on the the whole world when they come face to face with God, with their God. And it's a powerful and a sobering picture. We read in Joel, it's a time of darkness and gloominess. And that's, of course, what the trumpets symbolize, a warning blast, as we heard this morning from Dr. Meredith. It's sobering to think about what's coming As our people prepare to meet their God. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21 and verse 25 He says, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Mankind will finally come face to face with God. With Jesus Christ, whose face shines like the sun in its strength. If you think about it, it's a horrifying thing to be in that position. To be in rebellion against God and to have that come to you. But you know, we can also look at this day in a very different perspective because in verse 28, Jesus Christ says, Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. This day, is when it's fulfilled, is going to be perceived and experienced very differently among different people. And God's people, Christ says, when you see these things coming to pass, when you see the signs leading up to them, be encouraged, be strengthened, 
Lift up your heads. Keep your chin up. Stand up and be strong because your redemption draws near. For those of us who are a part of the body of Christ, we're not dreading the time of Christ's return. We're not dreading his intervention in the affairs of mankind. We're welcoming it because he's going to step in and stop the carnage and the violence and the abusive nature of mankind. And he's going to bring order to a world of chaos. And we welcome it. And we'll celebrate it. And we'll be joyous and joyful about it. And we're going to meet him face to face. You know, when you think about this day of trumpets, <clears throat> one of the things about it is it's a day of rejoice because we are preparing to meet our God. Brethren, as we think about the Feast of Trumpets today, we can learn a lot and we can talk a lot about what's coming, but are we preparing to meet our God? I'd like you to ask yourself that question as we think about these things. Let's go straight to the book of Revelation. In chapter 1 and verse 1, it is a day to rejoice because we are preparing to meet the God we serve. We are preparing to join into the family of God to be with him forever. We are preparing to know face to face he who we only know through the eyes of faith right now. He who is invisible. We are preparing to meet our God. I'd like to talk a little bit about that today because there's a lot of encouragement in the scriptures as we look into the future and especially in the book of Revelation. You know, the world looks at the book of Revelation a certain way. It's scary. It's mysterious. It's confusing. It's horrifying. And as we heard this morning, it's very sobering. But you know, God's people will see it very, very differently than the world. And there's a reason. Revelation chapter 1, let's start there. In verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Have you ever considered that right there in verse 3, a blessing is pronounced for those who live in the end time, those who live in the, the generation when these things are going to take place. There's a blessing pronounced for those who read those who hear, and those who keep the things written in this book. What does it mean to be blessed? And we sing the song, Blessed and Happy. Blessed, <clears throat> someone who is taken care of, someone who is helped, someone who is strengthened. We want to be blessed, right? We ask God to bless us. We live a certain way because we know there are blessings in that way. And he says here in the verse, the third verse of this book, blessed are you if you read it, if you hear it, and if you keep it. Do you want to make it in the years to come to be blessed, <clears throat> to be strengthened, to survive, to thrive, to endure? Read the book of Revelation. That's what God is saying. That's what Christ is saying. That's what John was recording. It's an unveiling of the events and the time of the end, and especially how to understand and interpret those events. If we want to be blessed, if we want to be ready for these times that are going to come upon us, we need to read the book. He writes this amazing introduction, verse 4. 
John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Isn't it interesting when we stop and think in the very beginning of the book, after he says those who read it and hear it and keep it will be blessed because of it, what did Jesus Christ tell his people? He reminds us that he loves us. Brethren, he reminds us that he loves us. Some translations here render it loved, some render it loves. Isn't that important as we go into the, the dark days ahead of us? To know that God has our back. To know that God is, is, is watching out for us. That Jesus Christ personally is working for our well-being no matter what happens around us. No matter all the plagues that we talk about, all the, the violence and all of the things that we, we hear about and we read about. He loves us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He proved it. How could you prove love any further than that? The book of Revelation starts off by Jesus Christ reminding us that he is for us and that he will take care of us. You know, that's huge. You know, when you were growing up, if you, uh, as a young person, you go out on the playground and there's a bully <clears throat> on the playground. Doesn't it feel good to have an older brother around? Doesn't it have, feel good to have someone who's as big as the bully and tough and who will defend you and help you and stand up to whoever is giving you a hard time. We have an elder brother. We have a big brother. He says right here in the beginning of the book, he is there for us. We make mistakes, we mess up, we get off track, we stumble, we fall. He corrects us because he loves us. We know that's part of it too. And thank God that he corrects us so that we can be prepared to meet our God. Young people, there's a lot of concern today in this generation about the future and about what's going to happen and about do I have a future and will there be anything left of this world by the time I I grow up and become an adult and want to get married and want to have a family and all of those things. There is hope for you, but it's through a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Now that is not, those are not empty, sentimental, Protestant words. It's true, it's real, that is how you will have a future. In the coming years ahead, young people, I hope you're listening. He died for your sins. He will forgive you when you repent. He will help you through the trials that are coming in the world that you will experience. You need to talk to him, young people, even if you're not baptized yet, even if you're not thinking about being baptized. Talk to him, get to know him let him know your concerns. Let him know your worries about the future. Tell him what you think about it. Get to know him and read the book of Revelation. There are blessings for those who read it, those who hear it, and those who keep it. We need to learn to walk with God. And that's our young people as well. <clears throat> Let's go on in verse 12. Notice he says, Then I turned to see, we're not going to read every verse here, but uh, skipping down a little bit, 
He says, I turned to see the voice, as John is describing the vision that he had on the Isle of Patmos, that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Really an incredible passage here when you think about it, describing in vision the, the glorified Jesus Christ that John was able to see. He says his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. You know, he, he had power. All he had to do is speak the word, and that was the sword. When he comes back, as we've heard, it will be with overwhelming force. It really won't be much of a fight when mankind resists him, rebels against him, and fights against him. It will be over very quickly. Because this is God. And his countenance was like the sun shining in his, its strength. And when I saw him, I... I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I am God. I am the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. I'm the ever-living one. I created you. I've been the one guiding humanity those who I have called. And I'm going to bring about a world of blessings and of prosperity and of peace and of hope. Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive evermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades or the grave and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. You know, it's interesting he explains as we understand the way to understand the Bible is to let it interpret its own symbols. And he's explaining that the lampstands are the seven churches, the the seven churches of Asia, and as we understand, the seven eras as well. And today we understand that we are living in the Laodicean era, the last era. So the message is to us. But I want you to notice something as well. What did it say about Jesus? He says, having turned, I saw the lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is in the middle of the churches. Jesus Christ is in the midst of the seven churches. Chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Brethren, not only does he say that we'll be blessed, if we read, hear, and keep these words. Not only does he remind us that he loves us and will take care of us through the horrifying times ahead, but he also reminds us that he is in the midst of the church. That's very important to remember. He is amongst the lampstands. He is walking in the midst of the church. You know, over the last 20 or 30 years, frankly before that, a lot of people who used to walk with us have stopped walking with us. And many have lost faith that Christ was really walking with the church and really guiding the church and really the head of the church and that he was in the midst of the church. Brethren, how important is it that we really see him guiding and directing and in the midst of his church. How much faith does that give us when we understand that he built his church, he prophesied that the gates of hell would not prevail against it, it would never die out. We read that in 
in Matthew chapter 16. But he's reminding us of that in the book of Revelation, that I am with you and I am with the church. How important is that, especially as these events come about and as we get closer and closer to them, as we get closer to the the wheels falling off of this world, chaos and destruction, that we really see him in his church. It's very encouraging to know that he himself is in the presence of the church, that somewhere on earth, will be his church. We can identify it. We can find it, as Dr. Meredith reminded us last year, last week, I'm sorry, about preaching the truth and doing the work and practicing real biblical government. Christ is there. That's what the book of Revelation says. You see a thread as you read the book of Revelation of God's care, his concern, and his intimate love for his people. Those who really love him, those who have really submitted to him, those who are submitting to the judgment and the rulership of him. We're going to need that in the future. We need it now, don't we? In the daily trials that we have. Brethren, if we're not sensing God's care and concern for us, who's at fault? Is it him who's deficient? If we are not perceiving his closeness and his guidance in our life, which one of us is wrong? Is it God or is it that we are not on the same page with him? If we don't sense that, we need to ask him for it. We need to ask him for help, ask him to help us to repent, ask him for comfort through our trials, for comfort in times of need and help, and even to correct us so that we can get on the same page. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Fascinating glimpse into the behind the scenes of what's happening at the very throne of God as these things began to unfold. Verse 8, now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll And to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Obviously, in the context, they're singing a song referring to human beings who are being redeemed out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, why does Christ open the seals of the scroll? The seals unlock judgment on Israel and on the earth. Why was he worthy? Why is Jesus Christ the one who is worthy to open the seals as this judgment begins to be poured out? He's the one who suffered in the flesh. 
He's the one who knows what it's like to be in the flesh. He's the one who's, who knows what it's like to be on earth. He empathizes with those who suffer, even when he knows it has to happen. He understands suffering. He's been through it. And who would you want to oversee this more than one who has been through it himself? He doesn't delegate that away. The opening of the scrolls to someone else, he does it personally. And we see in chapter 6, the, the seals begin to be opened personally by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Dr. Meredith went over this. The first four seals, uh, conquering religious system, warfare and strife, famine and pestilence and death. How close are we to these seals being open? We get closer every day. It's interesting to note that the United Nations is in session as of yesterday. And one of the people who, experts that was uh, interviewed about the situation in the world today was explaining that they are facing a bewildering array of issues and they're scrambling, the war nations of the world are scrambling to try to get a handle. Former policy planning director for the State Department, Anne-Marie Slaughter, was quoted as saying, it's hard to believe how many crises there are today. She said, I look at the newspapers every day and I think, what next? I mean, how many crises can you cram into the space of a week, a month, a year, where you have a global pandemic, newly aggressive Russia, a complicated deal with Iran, and an entire region imploding with terrorism, refugees, destabilization, all at the same time, and that's not even including the East China Sea. It's like reading the seals of Revelation. All of these things beginning to be ramped up. And we see other, other things happening. Germany, the Islamic world, the Catholic Church becoming more politically involved in the Middle East. <clears throat> the United States slipping. The fifth seal, of course, is the Great Tribulation. Let's just look briefly at verse 9. He says, when he opened the fifth seal, again, Jesus Christ is opening the seals. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. We understand this is the great tribulation. And he explains how this will be a, a terrible time. This is the time of Jacob's trouble and even persecution on the church. <clears throat> those who are not faithful and those who are not close to God. But brethren, let's again stop and take a moment to consider. We understand the, the tribulation is a time of Satan's anger. We will see that in a moment. But it's Jesus Christ who opens the seal. He's allowing it to happen. He uses Satan's wrath to teach his people a lesson. Let's turn, hold your place there, and let's just turn quickly over to Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2. Remember the story of Job and in the introduction how God is telling Satan about his servant Job. And of course Satan accuses Job to God and he allows him to do certain things. And finally in Job chapter 2 and verse 1, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan also came to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from when do you come? Etc., etc. And finally he says, have you considered my servant Job? Blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Satan answered, verse 4, and said, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. Notice verse 6. Very important principle when we think about trials, when we think about when, when our life seems to be out of control. Verse 6, and the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. 
Sometimes God does allow Satan to try us. God does allow Satan to afflict us. But God sets the parameters. God always says, here is how far you can go and no more. And isn't that what we're seeing as Jesus Christ is opening the scrolls, the seals, that he is in charge, he is monitoring, he is guiding the situation. He allows Satan to to wreak his wrath and his anger, but Jesus Christ is in charge. You know, brethren, as we face these days, it's very important that we see God is always in control. Because sometimes our lives feel out of control, don't they? And we don't sense that. We sometimes think, where are you, God? Why am I having this problem? Why am I being tested? This hurts. I don't like it. This doesn't feel like a blessing. But God sets the parameters. Same thing that Jesus Christ is going to do. God may be allowing some things to happen to some of you. Many of God's people are, are being tried, are being tested are having difficult trials. But if we're serving him, if we're submitting to him, if we're seeking him, it's always going to be only within certain limits. Now, when we get outside of his will, then we get in real trouble, don't we? Then watch out. But if we're seeking his will and we're seeking to be judged and ruled, brethren, God sets the parameters, and Satan cannot strike us beyond that. He cannot touch us. That's very helpful and to think about as we think about going into the future. Notice Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12, we understand. Uh, verse 7, war will break out in heaven. Michael and his angels fight with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels cast out with him. And then I heard a loud voice saying, verse 10, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren. And that's what he is, constantly accusing Day and night, he has been cast down. Verse 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. There will come a time when Satan is very angry and he will try to destroy anyone, especially God's people. But look at what's going to happen. Verse 13, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. Place of safety. We talk about the place of refuge where God is going to protect his people. Brethren, think about this. Does this sound like a a place that just sort of happens, Uh, just by happenstance, uh, God's people just go somewhere, and uh, there's no real direction, there's no real organization, or does it sound like God is preparing a place for her? It says, to her place. Jesus Christ is going to take care of his church going to take her to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent three and a half years the time of the tribulation the word nourished is interesting it means to be fed it means actually it also means to be fattened fat how does that sound you know place of safety you want to be fattened up um 
will be nourished. It also is used as a nursing baby. A baby that's helpless. A baby that cannot feed itself. And yet a mother is feeding that baby, taking care of that baby. It's a very intimate look at how Christ sees the church and how he sees us if we are coming under his rulership and we are submitting to his leadership and guidance. Verse 15, Satan is still angry, so the the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. This is symbolic of an army. We can see that in other places in Revelation. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Hold your place there, and let's turn over to Numbers chapter 16, because this happened before in a slightly different way. Numbers chapter 16 and verse 30. Get ready for some miracles. Put on your seatbelts. That's what Jesus Christ is telling us is going to happen. To protect his people. To take care of his people. Numbers chapter 16 and verse 30. This is the story of Korah and those men who rebelled against God in the time of Moses. And we're just breaking into the story, but in verse 30, Moses says, If the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up, the rebels, with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass, as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, and all the men with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. You know, you don't want to get crosswise with God. We don't want to be on the wrong side when it comes to those who trust God and follow him and those who are in opposition. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But the point is that God saved his people. He'll do it again. He'll work miracles. He'll take care of his church. Even if he has to open up the earth to save them. After that, what does the dragon do? Notice in verse Verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's not enough to just keep God's commandments. A lot of people do that. It's not enough to just believe in Jesus. A lot of people do that. We have to be close to him. We have to be close to him personally, and we also have to understand where the body is. You know, a lot of people think that there are parts of the body of Christ here and there and and over there, and and that's true uh, to some extent. We do not claim to be the only true church. We recognize that we have brothers and sisters in other fellowships, and some of them are part of God's church true church, made up of God's people, true believers, true Christians, parts of the body of Christ. But think about it for a moment. At some point, brethren, God will work this out, that the body that he is protecting will have to be, at least according to this, together in one place, in one place in space and time. So we as the people of God need to figure out where that body is. 
if we want to be protected, if we want to be taken care of. And the sooner the better. And we're here because we believe that this is where we want to be, need to be. <clears throat> That's what this passage implies. God is, is inter, his intervention is in one place, in one occurrence. And then what happens? It says he makes, he goes to make war with the rest of her offspring. Well, that could be anywhere. That could be scattered people. who have not understood the need to be a part of a body that's going to be protected. The point is that God will take care of his people. Our elder brother will take care of his people. He will not leave his church orphan. John chapter 14 verse 18 says that. Christ said to his disciples, I will not leave you orphaned. I will come to you. He says we will be blessed and guided in the end time if we read and hear and keep these words. He says he loves us, and that means correction from time to time. He says that he is in his church. He's walking amongst us. He says that he sets the parameters for even the most severe of trials. And he says he's going to nourish his people and protect them from the face of the serpent. Brethren, that is absolutely fantastic to know when we understand what is going to happen in this world. Our goal is that we need to be ready to meet our God. But how do we do that? We have to come to know him now. Notice in Revelation chapter 3, and verse 10, again talking about the protection that God will grant to the church in Philadelphia, breaking into the thought here. He says, because, verse 10, you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the arrow of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one will take your crown. And he who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. Apparently, there are some remnants of Philadelphia, because otherwise, why would they be protected from the great tribulation? He says he will protect those who keep his command to persevere. Now, as Mr. Meredith said, God might allow some of us to have to give up our lives as a testimony to our faith and to what God is doing. But the vast majority of zealous, faithful, committed, ruled, judged Christians will be protected. And that's very encouraging. In contrast, look at Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3 and verse, verse 20. Remember, Christ said he's walking among the seven churches. But notice what he says about Laodicea. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him. And he with me, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Just because he walks amongst the churches does not mean that he is personally involved or personally known by every individual, brethren. Especially when you look at Laodicea. He's outside knocking. He's outside the room knocking on the door. You know, maybe when we look back, we will look at and as we name different ages as the industrial age or the automobile age or the nuclear age or the space age, we will name this age the distraction age. Isn't that true? How many distractions do we have? And you know, brethren, these things can distract us right into the tribulation and frankly right out of the kingdom. Take an honest look at your life. 
Is God having a hard time getting your attention? Is he knocking on the door? Are we inside, you know, watching TV and we're kind of a, even get annoyed with the sound of the knocking so we turn the television up higher, figuratively speaking? Are we so full of distractions? And I'm not just talking about our young people. I'm talking about all of us. We, we lecture the young people to not get, not let their devices rule their life. But brethren, let's look at ourselves too. We're part of this world. Are, are we taking the time for prayer and study and contact with God that we need? There is a book called The Big Disconnect, Protecting Childhood and Family Relationships in the Digital Age by Catherine Steiner Adair. She says this on page 22. Psychologically, we are indeed in new territory. This was written about a, a year ago. Technology has changed the basic construct of our relationships. It has triangulated our connections with each other, becoming the ubiquitous third party in our conversations, sometimes connecting us, but often interrupting us and ultimately disconnecting us. What originated as a mechanism for communication is now driving, demanding, and sometimes distorting our communication. Now think about the devices that we use as a way of life constantly. In addition to communicating impulsively, we find ourselves driven to communicate more than we want or is more than is healthy for us. We've never had the expectation before that we should be available to anybody, everybody, anytime, anywhere. Now it is tech itself that is a constant presence, sometimes useful, sometimes annoying, but always it seems commanding our attention. Is it a coincidence that the Internet age has blossomed in the Laodicean era. The distractions commanding our attention. Brethren, who is ruling whom? We've never lived with that level of on-demand presence, and it is wearing us out. Children and parents are showing signs of relational fatigue, tech burnout, from the pressure of constant communication, the endless competition with screens for each other's attention, or trying to be there for all people all the time. Brethren, she's talking about competition with each other in our relationships. What about with Jesus Christ, who is outside the door, looking in the window and knocking and trying to get our attention? Are we listening? Or are we constantly doing other things that are more important? Are we running faster and faster, chasing something, but it's not fulfilling? If your life seems out of control, it's time to get off the merry-go-round and stop and think about where we are. And frankly, that's why we need the Holy Days as a reminder, the next two weeks, invaluable time. I think about one-eighth of the, the, the year's sermons that we will hear in the next couple of weeks or so. Lots of fellowship, messages on the big issues of life, who we are, where we're going, where we are in prophecy, how to interpret our world, what God is doing, what we need to be doing. Brethren, let's make sure we're tuned in over the next couple of weeks, we don't let these days go by without really grabbing onto the anchor, God being our anchor. Hebrews 6 and verse 18 through 20 talks about the anchor of the soul that we have fled to for our dear lives. Are we grabbing onto that? As the progression of events takes place, the sixth seal will be opened by Jesus Christ. That announces the day of the Lord, the heavenly signs. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 15. We find the response of most, most of mankind. It says, verse 15, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave... 
And every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Who will make it? Who will persevere in such a difficult time? Who will be ready to meet their God? That's the question he's asking. Let's hold your place and let's turn over to Malachi because it's interesting. He asks the same question and has some interesting answers for us. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger. He will prepare the way before him. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? Who will be ready to meet their God? He's like a refiner's fire. He's like a launderer's soap. He will purge the son of, sons of Levi. Purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. He says, verse 5, I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against the sexually immoral. In all the forms that that comes, brethren. Against perjurers, against liars. Against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans. And against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I do not change, therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances, have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. Who will stand in that day? Those who fear God, those who are close to him, those who have a relationship every day with Jesus Christ. Again, not a Protestant sentimentality. We understand. We know what it means. We know when we're falling short. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? He talks about tithing. He talks about cutting ourselves off from, from him by, tithing, by not tithing. Going on in verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Those who are going to be close to him will also be close to one another, will be sharing their lives as they are in the arena, as they are striving against sin. They will be encouraging one another. They will be fellowshipping in the body. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Brethren, again, how does God look at us? He says, they will be like my jewels. He cares for us. He wants to take care of us. Even in the darkest days ahead, but we've got to prepare to meet him. Going back to Revelation, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 8. So we find in chapter 8 and verse 1, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. <clears throat> and we heard about that earlier this morning, but I just want to point out one thing. He says he was given, there was an angel get, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. Verse 3, he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Again, just stop for a moment and think, even as two and a half years have already 
happened. The seventh seal is being opened. The trumpets are about to sound. How close is God to his people? Again, a glimpse of the throne of God. A glimpse of the picture where Jesus Christ is there and the Father is there. And what is before them? The prayers of the saints ascending before the Father. Brethren, how close can we be to God even as all of the chaos and the destruction is going on? Through our contact with him, through our prayers with him, he sees us as being right there, that our prayers are right there at the throne of heaven. Not far off, not something that is that God is not aware of. He's going to be very, very close and aware of the needs of his people. So what do we see as we look at all of these things? We see a God who is going to help us to make it during the hard times. He's close to us. He loves us. He's working through his church. He's listening to his brethren, encouraging one another. He's listening to their prayers. He's protecting his zealous people, and he's trying to get the attention of those who are not. Does God love us or not? Does God take care of us or not? We're reading the book of Revelation. Have you noticed? And yet look at how much strength and encouragement and comfort is there for those who have, are willing to be judged and ruled, as we heard. Jesus Christ will not abandon us at all. The seven trumpets sound, as we heard earlier, and finally in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15, the seventh angel sounds his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. We shall, he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, who is to come, because you've taken your great power and reigned. And thank God for the time when he will stop sinning mankind from destroying himself. The time when he will step in and intervene in Satan's world and take it over and, and stop the terrorists and the corrupt leaders and the abuses and the starvation and the suffering. The longer we live, the more we see this world for what it really is how corrupt it is, how evil it is, how much it needs to be gone and started over. And only God can do that. But th this world will not go down without a fight. Verse 18, the nations were angry. Your wrath has come, the time of the dead, that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. As we heard, there's a reward for being obedient to God, for being faithful to God, for being striving to be close to God and have a relationship with Him. Notice in Revelation 14 and verse 1, He talks about the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion having his father's name written on their foreheads. I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, like the voice of loud thunder. And they sang, verse 3, as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. What kind of relationship are we talking about with Jesus Christ? Following the Lamb wherever he goes. Brethren, are we preparing to meet our God by doing that today? Do we have that kind of close relationship with the Lamb today? And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now is the time 
when we are tested. Now is the time when we are stretched and tried in only ways that we know and God knows. But we have to submit to that testing. It's for our good. Don't ever cast off that yoke of God's testing of you and me. That's how we're preparing to meet him. We need it because we need to follow him no matter what. <clears throat> Brethren, can you imagine what it will be like to sing with 144,000 other people? I mean, we had the choir here a little while ago. A wonderful sound. How many do we have up there? About 30? 35? I don't know. Didn't count. 144,000, brethren. What an incredible sound that will make. Won't that be neat to hear? To be there with all of God's people, all of those who have committed their lives to follow the Lamb wherever He goes, no matter what. Do you think that God the Father and Jesus Christ will just stand back and stand aloof, you know, the strong, silent type, while all of their children sing? Or will they join in as well? Wouldn't you love to hear the voice of the Father and Jesus Christ sing? I remember hearing my dad sing on, on long trips. Sometimes we would sing in the car and I love to hear him sing, a strong voice, a wonderful voice. I can't wait to hear the Heavenly Father's voice and Jesus Christ's voice. It talks about it. It sounds like the voice of many waters. But what is it really going to sound like? I mean, that's a way of describing it, but I want to hear it. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2. He says, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of the, his name standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship you for your judgments have been manifested. This is the future. We understand the, the Feast of Tabernacles is when this is going to take place. All nations will come and worship and follow the Lamb where He goes. And we have an opportunity to be the pioneers of that. To know the future and to make decisions accordingly right now. What a precious Precious opportunity. But we've got to draw close to God or we won't be there. Revelation chapter 19 and verse, verse 6. Revelation chapter 19 and verse, verse 6. He says, and, as I, and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters... And as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. She is ready to meet her God. What a statement. And what a picture. The wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. It's coming. He will marry us. Interesting that he describes the relationship with Jesus Christ and the church in the terms of the closest relationship on the human level between a husband and a wife. Jesus Christ wants to have a relationship with us. You, me, young people, you as well. 
He's not leaving you out. This is, again, not just religious-sounding words. It's real, and we have an opportunity to get to know the real Jesus Christ right now. Again, when, when we're at the, the marriage of the Lamb, will, will Jesus Christ be sort of off in the corner, standoffish, not really wanting to talk to anyone? Or will this be an incredible time of fellowshipping, of embracing, of, of tears of joy? You know, we read in other places where Jesus loves people. He took children up in his arms. He wept for Lazarus. He loves his people. And he's looking forward to that. We've never seen him, but we know him as we walk with him every day. What a moment that'll be when we all see him face to face for the first time. Verse 9, Then he called to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. God wants us to make it. Blessed are those. Happy are those. Fulfilled. Strengthened. Guided. Directed. Encouraged. Comforted. Are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hard times are coming, brethren. But hard times build strong people. If we trust in God, and if we put our faith in God, and not in ourselves, or anything else. He shows us the path to make it, even in the coming difficult days. It's called seeking a deeper and deeper, closer and closer relationship with God. Every day, following their will, God and Christ, doing their work committing in every facet of our life, leaving no stone unturned. And you know, he will turn those stones over that we're trying to hide in the corner, that we don't want him to touch from time to time. He'll say, I want that one looked at now. And how do we respond when he does that? Do we bristle? Do we pull back? Or do we say, yes, Lord, I will follow you wherever you lead? I want you to show me any deficiencies, any blemishes, so I can be ready to be arrayed in fine linen. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 10. The end of the book, he said to me, this, the angel, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Again, this was written to the seven churches. The message was to everybody because whatever age that God's people lived in, of course, their lifetime was their time to prepare. But brethren, what age is it really meant to in particular other than those who are living in the days when these things would take place? The time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. In other words, at some point, our character is set. At some point, the time to prepare is over. And we will either be rejoicing or we will be ashamed for an opportunity missed. We heard about that this morning. Now is our time to prepare. There's no delay. <clears throat> Verse 12, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man one according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, may enter through the gates into the city. But outsider dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie, it matters what we do. It matters what our behavior is. It matters whether we submit to him and his laws and his direction. I, Jesus, have sent my 
angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root, the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Let's turn over to 1 John as we conclude. And as we close this Feast of Trumpets, this incredible day, that gives us so much understanding, warning, and comfort. 1 John chapter 2. In verse 28, he says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. God wants us to make it. Every single one of us who has been called, the callings of God are irrevocable, he says. Chapter 3 and verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it, ha it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he's revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. We will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as as he is pure. Brethren, we are so blessed to know God's truth to be here on this Feast of Trumpets and to begin the fall holy days, to understand our world, to understand why it's coming, crashing down, to have a chance to warn our people and face our future with courage and hope Let's get acquainted with our Savior, Jesus Christ, right now in perhaps a way we never have as we seek to align our lives to him. Let's make sure we're letting him correct us and guide us and change us in every possible way. He's going to intervene dramatically. That's the message that we have to the world, and that's the message to us as well. Brethren, as we keep these days and as we think about what's coming ahead, let's go forward, let's grow, let's change, let's repent and learn every lesson we need to learn. Because as he said, prepare to meet your God, O Israel.